Trump continues to outflank establishment Democrats to the left on some issues. Most recently, he's called out the military industrial complex by name. He signed an executive order to lower prescription drug prices to the same prices sold to other countries. And he's even mentioned looking into pardoning Edward Snowden. We're going to get into all of that. But first, please subscribe to the channel. Uh, you can also support the channel in various ways. The links are down below. I appreciate your support. So let's go through these recent statements made by Trump and compare them to the statements that have been made by Joe Biden. And we're also going to compare them to statements made by Bernie Sanders, because Bernie Sanders, I think we can all agree, is the uh, the furthest, most left politician that we have. I would argue that Tulsi Gabbard is actually even further left than Bernie Sanders. Um, but we but Bernie Sanders is more familiar. We're familiar with his policies and his platform. And he's been saying many of the same things for years and years and years. So we're going to compare statements to Bernie Sanders. He is going to be the mark of what is to the left uh, or what is the true left. OK, so um, let's go ahead. And, and also, we know that Joe Biden is the Democratic establishment and he represents the establishment. He has been ingrained in politics for the last 40 years, 50 years or so. So uh, Joe Biden is the establishment. Bernie Sanders is left wing. And then where is Donald Trump? You know, we don't really know what Donald Trump is. I, I know he's run on the Republican ticket. He's absolutely not a real Republican. Republicans were very shocked by his win. Republicans, <laughs> you know, they were blindsided by it. So he's definitely not an actual Republican. And he's certainly not establishment. Now, you can call Trump a lot of things. You could say that he's very crass. He's very vulgar. Uh, he's kind of a buffoon. Uh, you might not think he's very intelligent. You might think that he's for selfish gain, that he might just be out there to make money for himself and for his family. All of those things very well might be true, but I wouldn't call him establishment by any by any uh, stretch of the imagination. I don't think Donald Trump is loyal to the Republican Party, and I don't think he really cares what happens to the Republican Party after Donald Trump is out of office. You know, what we saw with Barack Obama, for example, is that he still cared about the Democratic Party. So he made decisions and he made deals and uh, he was fundraising on behalf of Democrats. We're not really going to see Donald Trump doing any of that when he no longer has the, the anything to really benefit. He doesn't have a he's not going to be uh, gaining, you know, if he's not running for office, essentially. So let's go ahead and start with the military industrial industrial complex and removing troops from the Middle East. Now, over the years, Trump has repeatedly talked about how disastrous our wars have been, in particular Iraq. He has been a big critic of Iraq almost from the entire almost from the beginning. George Bush made a mistake. We so, can make mistakes, but that one was a beauty. We should have never been in Iraq. We have destabilized right. the Middle East. You still think he should be in peace? I think it's my turn. Isn't it? You do whatever you want. You call it whatever you want. I want to tell you, they lied. Okay. They said there were weapons of mass destruction. There were none, and they knew there were none. There were no weapons of All mass right. Okay. destruction. Okay. All right. Governor Bush. Now, recently he went on camera and he actually talked about the military industrial complex. He named it by name. But you're not looking for some kind of conflict in Iran. And well, I'm the one that talks about these wars that are 19 years and people are just there. And don't kid yourself, you do have a military industrial complex. They do like war. I'm not saying the military is in love with me. The soldiers are. The top people in the Pentagon probably aren't because they want to do nothing but fight wars so that all of those wonderful companies that make the bombs and make the planes and make everything else stay happy. President Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, said Tuesday that Trump's remarks were more directed at the so-called military-industrial complex. This is actually really huge. No president since Eisenhower, I believe, has even said the words or the phrase military industrial complex. Uh, they might talk about the military. They might talk about defense sector, but they never say the military industrial complex. That is something that people who have become very critical of the military, uh, of our foreign engagements around the world, of our foreign intervention, of our toppling of regimes, of uh, toppling of governments, that is something that many of us have been uh, have the phrase we've used. We've been very critical of it, but I don't think any president has actually uttered that phrase. So this is actually a really big deal that he has said that. Um, instead, most presidents have been willing participants of the defense of the military industrial complex. Now, 
I do want to say that there is a big criticism on Trump that I've seen circulating around, and it is that Trump failed to remove the troops from the Middle East, that he made campaign promises to remove the troops, and that he ultimately is part of the of the establishment. He's ulti- ultimately a part of the military industrial complex, that he did not remove the troops. And I do want to make some, I do want to clarify that a little bit. Um, there was actually a bipartisan effort to stop Trump from removing those troops. The Armed Services Committee actually had an, um, an amendment to a bill that they voted on, and the amendment was essentially to stop Trump from removing troops from Afghanistan and from Germany. Now, they also had done previous attempts to stop him from removing troops from Syria and from Iraq, and that was bipartisan. It was uh, Liz Cheney from the Republican side was very much, she was uh, the big driver of that. And all but three Democrats in the Armed Services Committee voted for stopping Trump from removing troops from the Middle East. So Trump, his inability to remove the troops the way he's wanted to remove them has largely been stopped by both Democrat and Republican establishment uh, in in Congress. They do not want to remove those troops. Now, of course, I don't remember who the third one, and I feel so bad I don't know who the third vote was, but three Democrats. Now, there were eight Republicans who voted against the amendment. Eight eight, uh, Republicans wanted to remove the troops. Imagine this. Eight Republicans said, no, we are not voting for this amendment. We want to remove the troops from the Middle East. And three Democrats voted to remove the troops from the Middle East. So that is not something that people really, you know, in their, in, in, I think, mainstream mind, people think that Republicans are more the warmongers than the Democrats. And that is actually shifting quite a bit. And that vote with eight Republicans voting against the amendment, wanting to help Donald Trump remove the troops, and only three Democrats, that kind of showcases that. The three Democrats, I don't know the third one, but I know that the two were Ro Khanna and Tulsi Gabbard. They said, get those troops out of there. Uh, and I don't think we're surprised by that. Now, Ro Khanna was a big surrogate for Bernie Sanders. He lines up with Bernie Sanders on most issues, and so does Tulsi Gabbard. Uh, and she's got very much her own mind and very much her own uh, policy positions. And so that was very consistent for them to vote along those lines. So, um, you know, and I know that Trump talks really tough when it comes to foreign uh, foreign policy. He talks about taking out leaders or blowing places up or we're going to come at you 1,000 times than you could ever imagine. He talks tough, but he doesn't really follow through. And that's a big deal because uh, you can understand why somebody would want to give off the impression of, of strength and the impression of, you know, we're going to come at you if you screw with us. But ultimately, not going, following through with it, not engaging, not trying to get us into more conflicts is actually a really big deal. Bush got us into 11. He marched us into 11 different countries, conflicts in 11 countries. Obama added an additional nine to that 11. And Trump has not added any to that list. So uh, you can criticize the fact that he hasn't gotten us fully out. But you cannot say that he's worse or even the same as others when he hasn't marched us forward into more. So um, now his talking about the military industrial complex, him wanting to remove the troops, that's actually very much in line with what Bernie Sanders said. Bernie Sanders has, for the most part, generally always been against the war and endless wars in the Middle East. Gentleman from Vermont is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank my friend from New Jersey for yielding. Mr. Speaker, I don't think any member of this body disagrees that Saddam Hussein is a tyrant, a murderer, and a man who has started two wars. He is clearly someone who cannot be trusted or believed. The question, Mr. Speaker, is not whether we like Saddam Hussein or not. The question is whether he represents an imminent threat to the American people and whether a unilateral American invasion of Iraq will do more harm than good. Mr. Speaker, the front page of the Washington Post today reported that all relevant U.S. intelligence agencies now say, despite what we have heard from the White House, that, quote, Saddam Hussein is unlikely to initiate a chemical or biological attack against the United States, end quote. Now, during the debates, Bernie also called out the military industrial complex by name. That is also a really big deal. I suspect people all over the country who are watching this debate are saying, these are good people, they have great ideas. But how come nothing really changes? How come for the last 45 years wages have been stagnant for the middle class? 
How come we have the highest rate of childhood poverty? How come 45 million people still have student debt? How come three people own more wealth than the bottom half of America? And here is the answer. Nothing will change unless we have the guts to take on Wall Street, the insurance industry, the pharmaceutical industry, the military industrial complex, and the fossil fuel industry. If we don't have the guts to take them on, we'll continue to have plans, we'll continue to have talk, and the rich will get richer, and everybody else will be struggling. Uh, Bernie has said on numerous occasions he wants to bring the troops home from Afghanistan, Syria, and Iraq. He also agrees that these wars, they're endless and they're unnecessary and we should not be in them. So right there, it looks like Trump aligns uh, more with Bernie Sanders because look at what Joe Biden has said. What has Joe Biden said about the military industrial complex? Nothing. He has never said that phrase. He is very much in the military establishment. Um, What does he say about wars in the Middle East? He says that he wants to, he he has repeatedly said this year alone that he wants to keep troops in the Middle East. In January, he said, quote, I think it's a mistake to pull out the small number of troops that are there now to deal with ISIS. Um, Then even more recently, earlier this month, he said he wants to keep troops in the region. So Joe Biden is for keeping troops in the Middle East. He's for same old, same old, status quo, nothing will fundamentally change. And that includes the military industrial complex. Now, Joe Biden is uh, of the three. When you look at the three, Bernie Sanders, Donald Trump, Joe Biden, he is the most pro-military intervention. And that means Trump is actually to the left of Joe Biden, surprisingly. Now, he's not as far left as Bernie Sanders, But you could certainly say he's to the left of Joe Biden when it comes to the military and foreign interventions. Not to mention, Joe Biden has already sussed out who he wants in his cabinet. And he's already looking at Michelle Flournoy for Department of Defense, for Secretary of Defense, and um, uh, Susan Rice for Secretary of State. Both women are known warmongers. They're very much in line with Bush era politics. In fact, after the Bush era, they uh, Michelle Flournoy actually partnered with Bush era warmongers and created a think tank. And that foreign policy think tank actually guides was guiding. It ha- hasn't lately since the Trump administration, but was largely guiding the foreign policies of both the Bush administration and the Obama administration. So it's filled with these people that were very much in line, had the same line of thinking, and that was more foreign intervention. They're very much for preemptive striking going in first, starting the the tussle before anything can happen. So Joe Biden is going to be very much for the same when it comes to military industrial complex, uh, more of the same, more interventions, more toppling, more intervention. Trump is to the left of Joe Biden on that. Now let's talk about taking on big pharma and lowering prescription medications. Where does Trump, where is he on this? A few days ago, Trump signed an executive order to lower drug prices to the same levels other countries pay. Now, here is the executive order. I want to read part of it to you. It says, um, executive order on lowering drug prices by putting America first. It says here, purpose, Americans pay more per capita per prescri- for prescription drugs than residents of any other developed country in the world. It is unacceptable that Americans pay more for the exact same drugs, often made in the exact same places. Other countries' governments regulate drug prices by negotiating with drug manufacturers to secure bargain prices, leaving Americans to make up the difference, effectively subsidizing innovation and lowering cost drugs for the rest of the world. The Council of Economic Advisors has found that Americans finance much of the bio pharmaceutical innovation that the world depends on, allowing foreign governments, many of which are the sole healthcare payers in their respective countries, to enjoy bargain prices for such innovations. Americans should not bear extra burdens to compensate for the shortfalls that result from the nationalized public health care systems of wealthy countries abroad. So it's interesting. It has a lot of real Republican language in this executive order, right? When it says like, oh, Americans should not bear extra burdens to compensate for the shortfalls that result from nationalized public health care systems of wealthy countries abroad, like shame on them for having that. What's interesting about this, though, is that the executive order, it says, in addition to being unfair, high drug prices in the United States have all 
uh, also have serious economic and health consequences for patients in need of treatment. High prices cause Americans to divert too much of their scarce resources to pharmaceutical treatments and away from other productive uses. High prices are also a reason many patients skip doses of their medications, take less than the recommended doses, or abandon treatment altogether. The consequences of these behaviors can be severe. For example, for example, patients may develop acute conditions that result in poor, poor clinical outcomes or that require drastic and expensive medical interventions. So from reading that, you would think that a Republican administration, their answer would be not to lower drug prices to the same levels as other foreign countries, but instead to say, stop selling our drugs for cheap to foreign countries. You need to charge them the same price because we are subsidizing the innovation and that's not fair. That would be a very Republican position. It would be uh, stop allowing them to negotiate these low prices. You need to charge them the same you charge us. But instead, this executive order goes in a totally different direction. It goes in a Bernie Sanders direction. And it says that uh, we're instead going to going to only pay what those other countries pay. That's what we're going to do. You're going to sell the drugs to us at a low price. So the government is saying Medicaid and Medicare, uh, well, it's saying Medicare. So Medicare is buying these drugs and Medicare is paying for it. So we want the same price as these other nations. That what, that's what this executive order uh, demands from these big pharmaceutical companies. Now, uh, of course, it's going to be battled. It, you know, it hasn't implemented because none of his executive orders do. They always end up in court, even the good ones. I would really love to see who's challenging this executive order. Is it a bunch of Democrats? Uh, you know, are they going to challenge it? Are they not going to help this one go through? Because this would absolutely help many Americans in lowering those drug prices. It's at least a good step. Is it perfect? Is it, you know, is it enough? No, but it's a it's a step in the right direction. So, this is something that Bernie Sanders has been screaming about at the top of his lungs for decades. He has been saying that he wants to lower the prices of prescription medication to the same levels that other countries are paying. And here we are, you know, now Trump has signed an executive order doing just that. So in July... Uh, Trump also signed an order that allowed drugs to be imported from other countries. That's another big one that Bernie Sanders has been talking about for a really long time to allow that to happen, import these cheaper drugs. Now, Joe Biden, on the other hand, has a more moderate plan. He doesn't say anything about prices that other countries pay. His website states that he wants to, one, repeal the outrageous exception allowing drug corporations to avoid negotiating with Medicare over drug prices, two, limit launch prices for drugs that face no competition and are being abusively priced by manufacturers, Three, limit price increases for all brand, biotech, and abusively priced generic drugs to inflation. Four, allow consumers to buy prescription drugs from other countries, so he at least has that in there. Five, terminate pharmaceutical corporations' tax breaks for advertisement spending. And six, improve the supply of quality generics. So he doesn't talk about anything about price controls in comparison to other countries. Instead, he says, we want to be able to negotiate with you and we don't want you to price gouge, but not, you know, so because a lot of times drugs were going up 100 percent or 400 percent in some cases, drug prices would in one year suddenly be way more expensive for people. And he's saying, OK, we're going to stop that. But he doesn't talk about the reverse, which is lowering those prices to be more in line with what other countries pay. So you've got Trump, who, Bernie Sanders, who is the left marker for us, saying we need to lower drug prices to the same levels that other countries pay and we need to import drugs. Now you have Donald Trump saying exactly that same thing. And you have Joe Biden taking a more moderate approach, saying, well, we just don't want you to price gouge. In fact... Um, here's an article from 2015, or maybe it's 2016. This was in the last few months of the Obama-Biden administration. And here is an article. It says, Biden vows to push pharmaceutical companies to ensure patients can afford treatments. Vice President Joe Biden on Monday told a packed ballroom of biopharma investors and executives that after leaving the White House, he plans to push their industry to make drugs affordable for patients. So that's a good thing, right? He says, quote, 
We're going to convene a national conversation with pharmaceutical companies, many of you who are here, biotech companies and others, to ensure patients can afford treatments, Biden said. Too many Americans are forced to sell their homes, to go into bankruptcy so their loved ones can get care and hope for a cure. This needs to change. Right, that all sounds good. This needs to change while still not undermining the profit motive, making sure there's a genuine reward for effort. So he's essentially saying to them, we just need to stop these runaway prices. It's, it's what his platform says on his website for his campaign, stopping those runaway prices, stopping price gouging, but nothing about lowering the prices to what other countries pay. This in the, biopharma, in the, in the pharmaceutical uh, arena makes Trump to the left of Joe Biden. In fact, when you Google Joe Biden and Big Pharma, so put Joe Biden, Big Pharma into the Google search, you're going to get these types of headlines. Biden sides with Big Pharma against affordable coronavirus vaccine. President Joe Biden, first, he'd need to answer for his record on drug prices. Biden's campaign wins support from Big Pharma executives. Not good. Now do the same thing. Google Trump and Big Pharma, and these are the types of headlines you're going to read. Trump and Big Pharma tussle over drug price proposal with three months until election. Trump blasts Big Pharma again. Somebody's getting very rich and promises drug price legislation. Big Pharma pushes back on Trump's drug pricing plan. Pfizer says it could cost U.S. jobs. That is a big difference in those headlines. And I think it makes it really, really clear. Trump is to the left of Joe Biden when it comes to pharmaceuticals. Edward Snowden. Now, this one's kind of a shock, but Donald Trump is possibly or definitely to the left of Joe Biden on the Edward Snowden issue, believe it or not. Recently, Trump said he would take a closer look into the Edward Snowden case and consider a pardon. Do you want to give Edward Snowden a pardon and bring him back? You, you once suggested that Well, I'm going to look at it. I, I mean, I'm not that aware of the Snowden situation, but I'm going to start looking at it. There are many, many people. It seems to be a split decision. There are many people think that uh, he should be somehow treated differently, and other people think he did very bad things. And I'm going to take a very good look at it, okay? I mean, I, I've, I've seen people that are very conservative and very liberal, and they agree on the same issue. They agree both ways. Uh, I'm going to take a look at that very strongly, Edward Snowden. Yeah, please. It's kind of unbelievable, but, you know, hey, listen, he's saying that he's going to take a look. Um, he even told the New York Post that he believes that Edward Snowden might not be treated very fairly. So, um, you know, it's it's really interesting what his position is on on Edward Snowden. Now, he didn't always have this position. There was a time when he was calling Edward Snowden a traitor. He was uh, blasting Edward Snowden. But now he's saying, you know what, maybe we need to take a look at this case. Maybe we need to, uh, you know, see what's there. Now, Bernie Sanders has said this about Edward Snowden. He did break the law, and I think there should be a penalty to that. But I think what he did in educating us should be taken into consideration before he is Senator Webb. So, you know, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, you know, Bernie Sanders, his position has been let him come home and let him have a fair trial. Let him explain himself and let the jury decide. That's what needs to happen. Uh, Donald Trump is saying, you know what, let's take a look at this and maybe even consider a pardon for Edward Snowden, which would be incredible. Th that would be huge. That would be amazing. And then there's Joe Biden. Now, what has Joe Biden's position been on Edward Snowden? Well, he said he not only would not grant Edward Snowden asylum in the United States, but there would be consequences for any other nation who would give him asylum as well. In fact, Edward Snowden has said that Obama and Joe Biden and a few others actually actively stopped him from gaining asylum in certain countries abroad. Well, this is not an actively seeking. This is not a new thing. I mean, this is important history, uh, especially for those people who don't like me, um, for those people who doubt me, who have heard terrible things about me. It was never my intention to end up in Russia. Uh, I was going to Latin America, and my final destination was hopefully going to be Ecuador. I applied for asylum in 27 different countries around the world, traditional U.S. allies, places like France and Germany places like Norway, uh, that I felt the U.S. government um, and the American public could be comfortable that was fine for a whistleblower to be in. And yet every time uh, one of these governments got close to opening their doors, 
uh, the phone would ring and they're in their foreign ministries. And on the other end of the line would be a very senior American official. Uh, it was one of two people, then Secretary of State John Kerry, uh, or then Vice President Joe Biden. Um, and they would say, look, we don't care what the law is. We don't care if you can do this or not. We understand that protecting whistleblowers and granting asylum is a matter of human rights, and you could do this if you want to. But if you protect this man, if you let this guy out of Russia, there will be consequences. So you see, surprisingly, Donald Trump is actually to the left of Joe Biden when it comes to Edward Snowden. Um, shocker there. And, uh, you know, so look, I mean, there's definitely a lot of ways that Trump is absolutely not to the left of Joe Biden. There are many ways that Joe Biden is very much to the left of Donald Trump. But that should be expected because Joe Biden is running as a Democrat. And that's really my point here. My point here is, um, is Joe Biden more left than Donald Trump overall? Yeah, I would think so in a, in a lot of ways. Joe Biden has a lot of more leftist positions than Donald Trump. But why is the Republican sitting president more to the left of Joe Biden on certain issues? That's absurd. Joe Biden should at least be on par with the president on certain things. You know, so never should Donald Trump be to the left of Joe Biden. If anything, there should be maybe some things where they're the same. And then Joe Biden takes a more left position on certain things. And Trump, being the Republican, would take things more to the right. But that's not what we're seeing. Um, time and time again, we're seeing Trump outflank the Democratic establishment to the left. And I think this is what is, you know, this is part of the populist movement that we're seeing rising up. Uh, in our society. We're seeing people just say, we're fed up with the establishment. We want change. Donald Trump was a manifestation of that. That was the anti-establishment candidate that was running on the Republican ticket. And so the Republican voting base who were sick of the establishment, just as much as Democrats are sick of the establishment, picked the guy who was the anti-establishment candidate on the ticket. Now, that also was going on in the Democratic base. The Democratic base were also voting for the anti-establishment independent Bernie Sanders. They did not want a Democratic establishment person. In the end, Joe Biden ended up getting it, uh, it you know, and there's a million reasons for that on, on how that ended up happening. The establishment is very powerful. They're very smart. They know how to out, uh, they know how to outsmart most of us. Uh, if they don't get you with Russia Gate, if they weren't able to get you with Ukraine Gate, now they're getting you with coronavirus. And, you know, who knows what's after that if Trump wins again. I don't even want to know what they're going to go after next time around. Uh, but many people are just fed up with the establishment and people want to see that change. And so um, this is just really interesting. I just wanted to bring this to your attention. And, um, you know. So in some ways, Trump is to the left of Joe Biden. And I think what we're going to see is this shift happening in that Republican base. There's now more Republicans who are rejecting PAC money. There's more Republicans who are talking about Congress being bought off. You know, I know that uh, Matt Gates from Florida, the rep from Florida, he was the first Republican to start rejecting corporate PAC money. You've also got Ken Buck, who recently wrote a book about draining the swamp and talking uh, largely about how bought off Congress is, how it's very much pay for play, that a Essentially, the Speaker of the House is not there because they're the greatest leader in Congress, but instead because they're the ones who fundraise the most money. So there's a lot of Republicans that are starting to shift and they're starting to do an about face more towards the people. It's interesting times we're living in. Very interesting times we're living in. Um, Thank you so much for watching this video. Please subscribe. Also, the links are down below if you would like to support the show. I do appreciate everything that you can do. Um, and thank you so much for watching.